in search of with Leonard Nimoy. Uh huh. Uh, the very famous episode, uh, my favorite episode, the Castle of Secrets. And uh, I was really intrigued by the story of a man who was able to build something so unbelievable. And with Leonard Nimoy's narration, uh, adding the mystery to it, and seeing that somebody here, somebody in the United States, did something megalithic and unbelievable, uh, that just always really struck with me. And uh, I've, I've been interested in it ever since. About 10 years ago, I started looking into it seriously again for the first time, and I realized that no one had solved the mystery. No one was really making any headway uh, in in trying to find out the answer to what Ed knew. And so I decided uh, to take up the challenge, and I've been pretty obsessed with it ever since. Were you in awe with the structure? Absolutely. I've been there three times. That's and each lot. time I go, I am more and more impressed with what Ed Lee Sullivan was able to do. Because he did it with practically nothing. That, I think that is really the crux of the, of the whole mystery. Is he did it with almost nothing, which is impossible. <laughs> you can't do it with almost nothing. People who are really, really good at stuff like this, they need huge machines. They need lots of people. They need lots of planning. They need time. And it seemed like Ed didn't need any of those things. And did he not build it, and then he took it apart and moved it? That's the. Um, this is the part also. That you're, you're asking me great questions, because this is the unbelievable part. He picks it up. He builds it in one place, and he picks it up, and he moves it about 30 miles to Homestead, where it now sits. In fact, it, it's the coral castle is made of two different types of coral, because where he built it at the first place, was, it was comprised uh, primarily of oolite limestone. Well, when he gets down to Homestead, it's solid bedrock coral. So when you walk through the castle, you can actually, once you get the hang of it, you can walk around and see which part was made at the old place and which part was made at the new place. But yes, he was able to pick up and move this whole thing in two weeks. I had heard at RL that, that he had a truck driver show up with a flatbed truck, and he told him, okay, go away for a couple hours. And, and he said, what? He said, go you go away for a couple hours. It'll be loaded. And, and he loaded it somehow himself. And the truck driver was just baffled when he came back. Yeah, there seems to be, uh, there's that, that general story is out there. I've heard overnight. I've heard he walked around the corner and it was done. I've heard <laughs> a couple of hours. Um, so I think that the jury's still really out on exactly the time frame. But you have to, whatever it was, even if it was overnight, the man was able to load the truck up by himself overnight. Why would he not want someone to watch him? What, it, how was he doing it so fast? Yeah, how big were the stones? Uh, some of the stones that he brought down weighed 10 tons. 10 tons? And he weighs 100 pounds. I could barely and lift 100 pounds as some kind of fertilizer bag or something. Ten tons. Yeah, I'm going to have to be saving somebody's life if I'm picking up and moving 100 pounds or more. Jeez. That's, that's where I'm at in my life. Now, was there not a story of a couple kids that kind of peeked over at night and saw him working or doing something? Yeah, this was a very interesting part of uh, the Castle of Secrets. I remember this part because it involved children, and I was a child at the time. Well, people would try to spy on him and figure out how he was working, and, and he would just stop. And he, It was almost like he had a sixth sense that he could tell when people were around when he was being watched. Well, one time some children reportedly had kind of snuck up and was watching him, and they said that he was singing to the stones and that they were floating around like hydrogen. Oh, bombs. I love it. Sound and resonance. That, that just fascinated me because and and i didn't realize as a child but it's just like you said i believe there's some kind of resonance there that maybe he wasn't singing maybe there was a frequency being emitted that sounded like singing or humming 
Or maybe he really was singing to the Stones and it was amplifying some type of resonant effect. He once said that he knew the secrets of the pyramids, and he also wrote a book on magnetics claiming that every object could be magnetized, not just metal. I find both of those statements, R.L., to be fascinating. Uh, So do I, and I think that it's world-changing. You know, when you think about uh, how the pyramids were built, they were built with celestial alignments in mind. That was the goal. As we get into this, you will see, and I believe that I've conclusively proven, that Ed's castle is dedicated to celestial alignment. That's that's not a coincidence. No, I, th- I think you're right. Now, he's got one structure there that is called the Polaris Telescope. It's, uh, gosh, how, t- how tall is it with a big hole in it? Uh, it's about 30 feet tall. Oh, my God. And he was five feet tall. And he's five feet, and this thing has to weigh every ounce of 28, 28 tons. And it stands straight up, right? And it's perfect. Unbelievable. So here's the interesting thing. is It's called the Polaris Telescope. It's not a telescope. It actually doesn't fit that description. It fits the description of a sextant. And what a sextant does is it marks the position of a star in the sky. That, that I think, is why it's positioned where it is and has that hole up there. Right. So it has the hole and it has the wires, crosshairs in it, and, and you can look through the bottom part that he has on the ground that they are it's another hole in a rock with a crosshair and you look through that up through the quote unquote telescope and you can see Polaris on any clear night of the year. To me what's interesting is he went to a lot of trouble to do this. And the reason is because he was trying to prove something. I believe he was trying to show that he understood something a little bit differently than everyone else and that is astronomy. You see, he didn't mark Polaris. He marked exact true north. Because Polaris mm-hmm. isn't completely north. It's, it's off by about two degrees of true north. So technically, it's also a circumpolar star. Well, if you look through the Polaris telescope, you can see in every season that Polaris is in a different quadrant of the, qu- of the crosshairs. So what he's showing is that our axis never shifts. It never changes, because if it did, we wouldn't be able to see Polaris through the telescope every day of the year. Would something shine through that hole, either at night, or the sun would cast a shadow through it, or something? Was there a clue to it? Well, for me, and and I, I wanted to get into this a little bit later, but his moon dial... I mean, sundial, (laughs) I believe, is a moon dial. Um, I believe that the Polaris telescope wasn't just for looking out of, it was for something to shine through, just like you described. It's almost like bullseye. When he writes his book, he tells you he calculates his latitude and longitude. And I believe that the angle coming through the Polaris telescope and the spot that it shines on is the exact spot he's describing when he gives his uh, geoposition. If you were to look through the hole at a certain time, if you got it right, what would you see? Well, what you would see, I think, is in his writing he says, scientists should come and look at the red door, the telescope, and the sundial and see how they would change science. So I took him at his word, and I went and studied it. And what I realized is that he's showing that the Earth moves on an angular orbit to the sun, not in a flat stereo orbit. That the Earth orbits at an angle of 23.5 degrees, because our axis never changes. So if our axis never changes, that means our relative position to the sun stays the same. We just move at an angle to the sun. That's the only way it could work. And so he shows his sundial, how it tells time differently because it's an analomatic sundial and it's on a curved surface. And this is showing that he understands the true path the Earth takes around the sun. 
the Polaris telescope proves that the axis never changes, that there is no axial obliquity, as it's called, as, it, as our seasons change, that the axis points towards something else in, the, in, the, in space. It doesn't happen that way. And, of course, the red door, where it shows the sun and it shows the earth on an angular orbit, 21 down here, 21 up at the left hand, upper left-hand corner. He's showing the earth on an angular orbit to the sun. The Polaris telescope proves it, and the uh, sundial confirms it. He put all those three things together just to teach that one lesson, and it had to do with celestial alignment, yeah, where we are in space. And a message somewhere. Did he have a house there? Was there a house there? A house? Yeah, on Coral Castle. Some place where oh, he yeah, would... Oh, yeah, he had a small little... I, I think I've heard it referred to very accurately as Spartan conditions. Uh-huh. Um, Still made with the same room. stone? Um, that was actually made out of the stone from the old place. That he moved? That he moved. That was actually... He already had that built when he had moved the place down to Homestead. Okay. Uh, he had a room up top, and I mean a room, and not a very generous one. And then below that was his workshop where he kept all his tools. It was approximately the same size. Here's something interesting about Ed's room, is that in the ceiling of that room, mm -hmm. there's another hole and another crosshair in the ceiling of Ed's room in the Coral Castle. Yeah, these he, he was placing these... For some purpose, there was something going on. Yes, these are bullseye markers. Exactly. And I have to say, I loved what you said on um, Ancient Aliens, uh, Unexplained Structures, of course, my favorite episode, um, <laughs> where you said that, that somehow this was easy, that he just probably pushed these into place. Yes. I honestly believe that that is correct. I believe that he built the pyramids, like how the pyramids were built. He built the Coral Castle, how Puma Punku was built, Marco Wase, Saxe Woman, how these unbelievable megalithic structures were all made. He made it the same way. And just like them, he passed the secret down in the form of clues for future generations to figure out. Why did he build the Coral Castle? Was it for that girl he wanted that Agnes that he so desperately wanted uh, as a girlfriend? I, I'm going to tell you right now. I, I do not believe that he was building it for her. Okay. He wasn't waiting for some lost love. In fact, this is uh, one of the discoveries that, uh, this is a discovery I wanted to put out live on your program for the very first time. No one's heard this. Here we go. But I've figured out what Ed's Sweet 16 is. What do you think? Ed's Sweet 16 are the 16 alignments that he's carved into the east wall of the Coral Castle, what I call the Constellation Wall. Aha. Uh -huh. He shows 16 different celestial alignments. You see, um, on that episode in Search Of... The Castle of Secrets. They had a lady speaking who was describing the tour that Ed would give. And she said something very specific that I'll never forget. She said that he would look up in the sky and his voice would get very ethereal. And he would say, one day, my sweet 16 will come. He would look up in the sky and say, one day, uh -huh. my sweet 16 will come. He was talking about the 16 alignments that have to happen simultaneously for him to be able to accomplish his work. And would we know astronomically when that would occur? Uh, yeah, I have an idea. <laughs> they must have software that would do that for you. You know what? Actually, it's so easy. Uh, I used uh, uh, Google Sky Map. And you just put it together you. that way. Yeah, and so what I did was once I figured out that the east wall was constellations and stars and planets and alignment. That was your template, wasn't it? That was my template, and so what I had to do was I just... Uh, SkyMap has this great little feature where you can travel through time, and you can see celestial alignments as far back pretty much as you want to go. And so my job was to sift through the millions of 
possible combinations until I got to the right one, and I actually figured out the the day, the year, the month, the time, everything. It's September 10th, 1923, at 7 p.m., 8 minutes and 23 seconds, Eastern Daylight Time, which was the exact time of a full solar eclipse. Wow. Now, will it happen again? That is a very good question, and I am not sure of that yet. Again, I have to sift through (laughs) and look for that alignment, which is very specific, because when you're looking for one alignment, not so tough. Two, not so tough. Five starts to get difficult. Sixteen is a nightmare. What happened to him, R.L.? Did he just die out there, or, or what? Well, um, according to uh, Rusty McClure's book, uh, Coral Castle, the American Stonehenge, by the way, my favorite biography of Ed, um, he conclusively proved that Ed died from a kidney infection. Now, here's something interesting. He died when he was 64 years old. Young age. It is. It's also 16 plus 16 plus 16 plus 16. Uh-huh. Huh. Uh, Homestead, Florida, 16 letters. That's weird. There's 16 steps going up to his room. There's 16 alignments on this floor. <laughs> 16, 16, 16, 16. And you do not have a website, right? Uh, no, I don't. Um, I do have a uh, YouTube channel. Oh, how do people find it? Oh, uh, simply uh, go on to uh, it's uh, YouTube. Um, dot com uh, slash user slash talking to lead Scalman. Oh, okay. And you got to Google that, folks, to get the, the spelling of lead Scalman correct. We're going to come back more with R.L. Poole as we talk about his work into the Coral Castle. An amazing story of how a hundred pound man was able to move tonnage of blocks. We have linked up R.L. Poole's YouTube channel to his name at coasttocoastam.com so you can look at some of his work as we talk about breakthroughs and understanding Coral Castle and Edward Leed Skolnin. It's an amazing story. Welcome back to Coast to Coast. R.L. Poole with us. R.L., some people say that Leed Skolnin left behind some tools, some artifacts, a huge tripod, which they thought he used to lift the blocks. I'm not so sure he did that. In some kind of broken magnetic-type device, or something like that. Do you, do you know anything about that? Well, uh, I do know a few things about it. Um, one is there are pictures of him using tripods um, and seemingly using them to lift blocks. Uh, that's what he has shown in the photographs. Once you get to know Ed a little bit, you see how he thinks. And what he likes to do is he likes to fool you right in front of your face. Like a magician. Like a magician, exactly. And he's very good at it. I, I've often told people that if Ed were alive today, um, he would be a big fan of the Riddler. Because <laughs> that's who he is. He is the Riddler. And I have been trying to figure this out for a long time. I just, when I look at the pictures, it doesn't make any sense to me. No, of course not. Uh, you're going to ask. You're going to, uh, to me, when people say that Ed did this with a tripod and and a hoist and pulleys. I just, it doesn't make any sense. And it's a wooden tripod, isn't it? I'm sorry? It's a a wooden tripod, isn't it? Yeah, it's Florida pine. Um, We're told to believe that Ed did it in some way that's completely prosaic and explainable, that he can get three pine trees to hold 28 tons. First of all, that's ridiculous. And how do you move the block over to the tripod or do you take yeah. the tripod to the block, but still, it makes no sense. Yeah, once you lift it, how do you move it? And where do you put it? So in one of the photographs, uh, it shows him with the uh, tripod, and he's standing there, and there's a hole, a square hole cutting in the coral bedrock, and the block is already laying off to the side. <laughs> See, he's showing you that this isn't... I just say... 
You can't make five-ton chains lift six times past their limit. You can't make three pine trees hold 28 tons. You can't get a sheet metal box on top of the tripod to hold the pressures of the tripod and the 28-ton block and the, and the hoist and keep that tripod together. There's no way. If you were going to do that, that's a suicidal setup. Absolutely. Now, he had a little black box, RL, on the top of the tripod. What was that? Um, Some people have speculated that that's how he held the top of the tripod together. Um, They say it's a wooden box. I have looked at it uh, under close magnification, and it looks like a box made out of sheet metal to me. It's very thin. I have a suspicion that... Uh, and I'm going to do the calculations on this, but I'm pretty sure that that box is just about the exact size, and width, and length of the perpetual motion holder that Ed had invented. And I believe he may have had a perpetual motion holder up inside the box on top of the tripod. In fact, that might have been what he needed the tripod for in the first place, was if this perpetual motion holder was responsible for emanating or resonating radio waves when current passed through it, that you'd want it above the coral, resonating down onto it. And that might have been what he needed the tripod for in the first place, and the stones, he didn't need it for them at all. Probably one of the greatest mysteries ever. Now, you have some kind of discovery as well with the secret schematic. Tell us about that. Did that yeah, in, was, the, was that the alignment? No, this has to do with the perpetual motion holder. On his uh, book, Magnetic Current, he has those two little lines on the cover of the book. Okay. And there's another one called Animal, Vegetable, and Mineral Life, where he has a hand-drawn sketch of the perpetual motion holder. One year, I was... Um, over Christmas holiday, I was watching Iron Man. Now, bear with me. I'm going somewhere here. Okay. Um, and I had the books with me while I, I, I was obsessed over Ed's writings, and I carried his books everywhere. I always had them near me. I'm watching Iron Man, and I'm watching him in the movie. He's showing his uh, partner how he's hiding this schematic of the Iron Man suit, and he's got it on... Di- different parts of the design on different pieces of paper. And when he overlaps all the pieces of paper and you look at it through the light, you see the whole Mark I armor. And I'm looking at the TV and I'm looking at the booklets and I'm looking at the TV and I'm looking and all of a sudden, oh no, I picked up the booklets and I overlapped the covers, held them up to the light, and it creates a completely different diagram. Those two little lines that are on the book cover of Magnetic Current when you overlap it with the other booklet, creates a schematic, a diagram that matches up perfectly with the other drawing. That's dramatic all by itself. It, no one has seen this for decades. And I, I have to say, when I first saw it, when I'm standing there at the window and I'm looking through the covers and I see this diagram, it hit me. Ed left that for me to find. He didn't know it, and I didn't know it. But at that time that I was looking through the window, the only two people who knew that diagram was there was me and Ed. Would you have liked to have met him, R.L.? Oh, I would love to have sat down with Ed. I don't know that I would have been his kind of guy, um, but I... I would have loved to have just sat and just spent some time and just got to know who he was as a person. Um, I think he was a very tough person. He was very tough on himself. Uh, I think that contributed to his death because he didn't seem to take very good care of himself, did he? No, he did not. How do you think he learned? Let's assume he was able to move these blocks with sound resonance or magnetics or something like that. How did he learn this? Where did he learn it? It's my opinion that Ed was a genius of observation. I believe that he had the ability to notice things that other people did not. That he, the way that the Egyptians, that other places have put clues 
into their megalithic structures, I believe that he was able to take them apart, like I'm trying to take the Coral Castle apart, and that he was able to observe something that we were not. And that he had this theory about how it was done, and he did experiments, and I think that he did it very scientifically. But it was all based on his own internal observations. I don't think anyone taught him this. I think it was something that he was able to deduce through deductive reasoning from what has been left to us before. Now, currently, a family owns it. Are they still using it as a tour guide place? Yes, it's it's called the Coral Castle Museum right now. And uh, it is uh, open uh, almost every day. Uh, and tours are available. Um the last time I went there, uh, the place, the grounds were absolutely immaculate, and the staff was very friendly and helpful. Uh, the one part that I I would walk around, and I went ahead and, and had them give me the tour, because I wanted to hear all of the folklore that was associated with the Coral Castle. Mm-hmm. And it was very interesting to hear, and it's also uh, extremely misleading once you start, you realize that Ed has pulled the wool over everyone's eyes. And that... He had to have, because he, nobody knows how this was done. But but I believe he was fair. And I believe that he... So here's what happened. was When I found the secret schematic, I realized right then, Ed is the Riddler. He has left clue after clue after clue, and I realized that if I'm going to investigate, I have to assume everything I've been told is wrong or a lie about the Coral Castle. And were these clues obvious or hidden? They are available to the discerning eye. You Do you have to know what you're looking for? Well, I didn't at first. But once I, and that's what was so important to me about the secret schematic, was that not only was that discovery important, but it gave me so much insight into who Ed Lee Scullin was that I could kind of put that lens over my eye and start critically looking um, at the Coral Castle. And for me, he puts the very first clue at the admission sign. He wastes zero time giving you clues. And tell us about the clue. Sure. When you look at the admission sign, as you go in, it's a five-pointed star, and it says admission ten cents, and it has that kind of weird sense. Ten cents, how oh, cool! <laughs> and then it says drop below. If you look underneath that, in the unfinished coral, in the little just below the little pipe where he receives your ten cent admission, there is a word scrawled in the coral that you can see in the oblique lighting of the early morning sun, and that word is spica. Spica? Spica. What does that mean? S-P-I-C-A. And I saw it one morning when I was visiting uh, Ed's place, and I'm like, I took a picture of it because I said, I think that's a word, is it? And it took, and so as I'm standing there looking at it, I realized it's about nine in the morning and the sun's hitting it just right. That's a star, isn't it? Spica is, yes, and I had to look it up. I didn't realize that. So he's got a five-pointed star as the admission sign. It says drop below, and then below that it says spica. So I didn't know what that meant, so I looked up spica, and I found out that it's the brightest star in the constellation of Virgo. And one of the brightest in the night sky. Absolutely. And then I found out, here's the clincher, I found out the old-timer's reference for how you find spica in the night sky. It says that you drop below Polaris, follow the arc of Arcturus, and you will arrive at Spica. That's how you remember how to find it in the night sky. Drop below. So he put all these little clues everywhere. The entire place is a puzzle. I have figured out maybe a tenth of what's there. But now we know it's there. That's the important part. And once you start looking through that lens at the Coral Castle, I believe it's only a matter of time before this gets solved. If you had that audience with him, what would you be asking him? 
because he probably wouldn't come out freely and say, this is how I move these blocks, RL. I don't think he'd tell you that. No. Um, I'm not sure what I would ask. I guess um, I would ask him why it was so important for him to be the one to build the castle um, and why he didn't want anyone else to help. And why did he move it? Yeah, that's a, a mystery, too. You have to, when you look at the geography, though... Um, was he bullied or something? Well, they, there was a story that he was, uh, that a group of guys had robbed him, or came to rob him, or they wanted the secret, and they had, uh, unfortunately, beat him unmercifully. Oh, God. and he's only 100 pounds. They could have killed him. He's this little guy, he's an immigrant. He doesn't bother anybody. He he's always been said to be as gentle as a lamb. And so maybe he just he figured died. enough of this area. I'm leaving. Right uh, now, I'm also not sure that that isn't a cover story, because hmm. if you look at where he put the Coral Castle, it is right on one point of the Bermuda Triangle, like a ley line or something. Like, it's, it's directly on a ley line. Uh, it's also as close as you can get to the Tropic of Cancer. Um, and the Tropic of Cancer, when you follow that line around the world, you get the Bermuda Triangle, you get the Dragon's Triangle, you get the Zone of Silence, you get all of these kind of really weird places are all along the Tropic of Cancer. And he moved his Coral Castle closer to it. And I think that he might have moved it there because it just simply made the work easier to do once the alignments were were in place. Seems like he was just one heck of a lonely, amazing person, R.L., doesn't it? Yeah, he, there's always a sadness about him, though, wasn't there? Yes. A loneliness, a sadness. Um, I feel like he saw the world a certain way that no one else did or could appreciate at the time. Was he prophetic at all? Did he say anything that uh, we should know about for the future? I believe that he, in his written works, was able to give us a unified field theory of physics. He talks about, see, uh, some of the greatest minds in the world, even Stephen Hawking, readily admits that Oh, you still there? Weird. Well, we'll try to get him back, too. This is a strange, strange night. Huh. Okay, but we're talking with R.L. Poole. Uh, he uh, doesn't have a website. He's got his YouTube channel that we have linked up for you. He's, he's just a researcher. He's working on a book about Coral Castle, but... Uh, it's not here yet. So he's one of those rare individuals who just loves the subject matter and the topic at hand. And here he goes. There you go there, R.L., you're back with us. Yeah, sorry about that. That's, uh, do you know, what do you know what happened? No, I don't. It just dropped. Okay, well, we're glad you're back. I've got a little feedback like from you. pick up where I was? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So even Stephen Hawking admits they don't understand gravity or its principal role in the universe. Ed explains this very clearly, that gravity is magnetism. Gravity is an expression of magnetism. Electricity is an expression of magnetism. Life is an expression of magnetism. It's all magnet. We live in a magnetic universe. And this is the common bond that should do away with quantum mechanics and relativity as separate entities. That magnetism explains it all. Well, the great thing that he was able to do was he was able to talk about magnetism in that booklet, that little book he wrote. I have one of those back in St. Louis. And he is convinced that every object can be magnetized. What do you think of that? Well, uh, and this is what I say is so, is so brilliant about him, because he realizes that everything is magnetic. If it has gravity, if you want to call it gravity, okay, uh, let's say an apple 
has slightly less gravity than, say, a person, right? But we can react to things the same. We are both held to this planet. We are, we, if you throw us up, we fall down. We're subject to the same laws. So if all those other things are the same, then we can be treated the same. We can, everything can be moved or levitated or uh, changed because the thing that holds it together, he says it's cosmic force, that it is what holds together the earth and everything on it. So that means that we are all made of the same stuff in the same way which means that as it applies to magnetism, there kind of aren't any rules. R.L., what does your gut tell you in terms of how he might have built this and moved those stones? If I could if I could just sum up my theory, I believe that he was able to use magnetism to and uh, combined with uh, charged water and a radio frequency to break the magnetic bond between coral and water. He would pour water over the coral and saturate it, expose it to this frequency, and it would cause the magnetic bond uh, between the water and the coral to break, and then they would bond, and the coral and clay would become one substance. It would be like clay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, when you break the magnetic bond between the water and the coral, you also break its magnetic bond to the earth simultaneously, which would make the coral neutrally buoyant. Not levitate, but neutrally buoyant. Okay, you stay with us. We're going to come back in a moment on Coast to Coast AM and take phone calls with you as we talk about Coral Castle. And welcome back. R.L. Poole with us. We talk about Edward Leed Skullin and Coral Castle. And how about we take your calls as well? Fascinating, fascinating subject. And welcome back to Coast to Coast. George Norrie with you along with R.L. Poole as we talk about Coral Castle. How big is the structure, R.L.? Uh, the entire structure? Yeah, a- around the Coral Castle area. Uh, it's about an acre. Oh, that's not bad. No, it's actually really nice. It's actually set on more land than that, but the actual Coral Castle itself takes up about an acre of land. What did that do for a living to make money? Well, he, uh, for a while, he raised uh, vegetables and stuff and would sell them. Um, he, of course, would give tours of his, what he called Rock Gate Park at the time. Of course, I wonder what 10 cents was in those days, right? Right. And then he also would sell his uh, written works, his uh, pamphlets, his scientific Works. On magnets and stuff like that. Right. He had a correspondence. He took out an ad uh, where you could correspond with him, and he asked you to send him a $1 bill, and then he would send you his written works. Maybe he made so a lot of money. Doing very it. highly of them because that was a dollar back then. Oh, that was a lot of money. It's like, what was it, $10 today? Yeah, about, I would say. Was he likable? You know, I think that there was a kind of a weird veneer to Ed that I think some people kind of poked fun at or was made uncomfortable by. But so many people said that he was a quiet, polite, gentle soul um, and that he was very meek. And unless he was talking about the castle and then he would become very animated and very excited. But... I don't know anybody who ever said Ed did anything wrong to them, ever. Oh, that's a pretty good testament, isn't it? It is. And how old was he when he died, do you know? He was 64. 64, yeah. Yeah, he died that's... December seventh, 1951, at 64 years old. 16 plus 16 plus 16 plus 16. It sounds like he didn't have a lot of friends, though. No, I think that that was purposeful uh, on his part. I think he wanted to be alone with his thoughts. And I think that Ed uh, spent a lot of time in his younger life being misunderstood by people. And I think he just realized that he, he, he would be in better company to be alone. Let's take some calls here for you. We'll go to Joe in the Bronx to get things started. Hi, Joe. George, how are you? I wanted to speak to R.L. Poole about, uh, you mentioned the star spica. Could that 
be instrumental in uh, that coupled maybe with the Earth's magnetic core. Uh, could that be instrumental in helping to lift these heavy stones? I mean, as far as star power or star energy is concerned. Could uh, you have found what a way? I believe was that Spica was the clue uh, to lead you to the constellation wall, the east wall of the Coral Castle. And then all of those alignments that he shows on the wall, including Spica, I believe the celestial alignments are the key. He talks about in Magnetic Current how sphere magnets, how you can do certain things with sphere magnets. And, and what are celestial uh, objects? They are large sphere magnets, aren't they? Big, heavy, dense, magnetic objects. How did he know? Around in space. RL, how did he know so much about celestial objects? Well, I, I'm not sure. I, they did say that he spent a lot of time at the library. He read uh, voraciously. Um, obviously, from what he said, he was obsessed with the pyramids in Egypt, and the Egyptians were obsessed with celestial alignments. And I think that he noticed, rightly so, that celestial alignments and megalithic structures are inexorably linked to one another and cannot be separated. Um, so I believe that, and on this day that he shows on the wall, Venus, the sun, the moon, and the earth are all aligned in a perfectly straight line with the celestial equator, the ecliptic equator, and all of these celestial objects are in a straight line like billiard balls in a straight line with each other. And it's also during a total eclipse. I don't think that that's a coincidence that that's the time he shows on the wall. And I don't think it's a coincidence that it happens in 1923, the same year he built the castle. And it's also the same exact time he put in stone forever in his own castle. I don't think these are coincidences. Can we say that there is no humanly possible way that he physically moved those stones and those blocks as of this moment yes it is true and there are people out there who are trying to do it in the the old way that ed did it and so far no one's no. even come and they have to do it by themselves Right, and there was a guy, uh, his name's Wally Wallington, uh, I'm sure you probably know him, George. Yeah. Um, he, he showed how you're able to move, like, very large pieces of stone with pebbles. Here's the problem. That's concrete. He didn't have to cut that out of the earth. That was poured on top of the land. And you might be able to move it sideways a few feet and this and that, but how do you get down and cut a block out of the earth, lift it up, Pull it out. and then move it? That's right. And then once you get it out, how do you stack it? And how do you stack them so high, like the, the uh, obelisk? Well, do you think he might have had some extraterrestrial help? I have to tell you, I don't think that that's out of the realm of possibility. I looked at one of the postcards that I bought from the Coral Castle Museum gift shop. And on there, it's Ed standing in front of the large crescent, just standing there looking off into space. And uh, in the front of the picture, at the bottom right, there are these strangely humanoid-looking shadows that do not belong there. As soon as I saw it, my eye went right to it. I said, these, these are not shadows. There's nothing to make that shadow there. Because I've been to the castle several times, and I know exactly where he was standing. And there's nothing to cause these very distinctive humanoid-looking shadows. And I always wondered, did he take a picture of his friends <laughs> while he was there? He might have, knowing he might him. Have, and I have to tell you, I, I think that this is what's been happening all along. I think that the gods in Egypt were, they were ancient travelers who came here and shared their secret. To them, it's probably Boy Scout technology. <laughs> Well, he knew the secrets of the pyramids. Frank in Hollywood, Maryland, welcome to the show. Hi, Frank. How did George glad to be back with you? Thank you. I was just wondering if if Mr. Skolnick had uh, a can you put a patent on a scientific like uh, E equals M squared? I mean, uh, to what extent can you 
can you come up with a patent? I mean, he would have become the wealthiest man in the world, but he would have uh, uh, probably caused a lot of jobs to be uh, uh, forgotten about. But uh, to what extent is science and, and a patent? Uh, well, I think if you've developed something, you can put a patent on that. Uh, but I'm not sure the formula of E equals MC squared could have been patented. R.L., what do you think? Well, I think it's the difference between uh, pa- uh, an invention and an idea, I think, is what we're trying to make the distinction of here. And if it's a scientific discovery, instead of a patent, what you get is credit. <laughs> uh, and where, But actually, Ed did have uh, some things he submitted to the patent office um, and it actually got rejected. Uh, but as far as his ideas, and I think that the reason that he didn't come out with his ideas was because he spent his life trying to understand what he had figured out. Ed, Ed was not a, a highly educated man. English was not his first language. Why did he keep the secrets to his breast, though, so close? Why didn't he just publicize it and tell everybody? Well, I, and that's what I think, that he was trying to fully understand it before he put it out because I think that in his mind, if he had said, look, I figured out, look what I can do and look how I do it. But he didn't really understand how it worked that it could be taken away from him or that it could be abused. Uh, These clues are left for someone who's very determined and paying attention. And I think that he set the bar very high for someone to figure this out, that he wanted the person who figures this out is going to be of the intelligence that they wouldn't abuse it. Let's go to Colleen in Alamogordo, New Mexico. Good morning, Colleen. Hi. Hi there. there. Yep. Okay. Uh, I want to discuss the universe being magnetic. Well, stars initially have a sound frequency. And if that sound frequency with magnetism and math together, that could that create the tie that she is discussing? Hmm, I'm not sure. Because that could be very good concerning the sound frequency from a star and equaling that with mathematically how gravity is used upon that of the Earth. Well, how would he and have... And then making that mathematical connection... How would, he have, did, how would he have discovered the sound of that star? Well, there are stars within the universe that have different sounds. Dwarfs have different sound. Our star has different sounds. And there are items that they point at the star, and it gives a representation of a hum. But okay. I'm not sure he had that kind of equipment. Well, there's equipment, I believe, that they have at NASA where they can listen to stars, literally. Yeah, but you're talking about a guy from the 1920s. Let let me check in with you, uh, R.L. I don't think he had high technology, did he? Uh, No, he didn't. Um, There are radio telescopes, of course, and that they have detected the frequency of stars. But he didn't have that kind of equipment. But he didn't have that ability. But here's something interesting about radio frequency, though. If you refer back to Rusty McClure's book, uh, America's Stonehenge, he talks about a story in there where the military came and spoke to Ed. I can't believe I've never heard this story before, but when I read it, I was in the, I was in the car on the way home from the Coral Castle reading the book, and I read this, and I was like, oh, my God, stop the car. <laughs> The military came and spoke to Ed, the Air Force, because something Ed was doing was interfering with their communications. Now, that's interesting. Now, when he got, when they came there to see him, he took him around and showed him his antenna and his, uh, his uh, radio setup and all those things, and they kind of just said okay and left him alone. But what I realized was you don't, interfere with communications by receiving a signal. You interfere with communications by producing one. And it must have been on a frequency that jammed one or more of their frequencies. 
And that put me on to the theory of, I believe what he was doing was a combination of electricity, magnetism, and radio frequency. Whatever it was, he has learned it from a long time ago. Yes. Yes, that what he has learned is ancient. And the technology, you could have done it back in the uh, Egyptian times. Oh, yeah. There's no question uh, about because it. Because it's simple technology to make uh, what they call a foxhole or a crystal radio. Uh, it's very simple technology. You can build it out of a pencil and a rusty razor blade and a, <laughs> and a bit of wire. I mean, they're not hard to make. Let's go to uh, Lynn in uh, Vancouver, Canada for you. Hi, Lynn. Go ahead. Hi there. Thanks for taking sure. my call, George. Hi, RL. Hello. I'm, I'm fascinated by this. Uh, I, I want to speak to the magnets and the magnetism, and sure. we're all magnetic. Um, I have a couple of uh, short uh, points, and then a quick question, and I'll take my answer off the air. You got it. So um, uh, it started to remind of a book I heard about written somewhere in the late 1960s, and it was called Gravity is Push. And I believe it was by a professor out of Berkeley. I, I don't, I can't recall the exact, but the book, I remember the name being Gravity is Push. And um, <clears throat> that, that's one quick comment. Now, the other thing, um, in regards to just the construction method with the levitation and figuring out the magnetism and vibration, blah, 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 um, I remember traveling on the bus, this is several years ago, and you know you see the construction guys at the end of their day, they're all dusty and, and head to toe, you know who they are, they're building another great skyscraper in Vancouver. And so I, I got to sit with the guy because it was the last seat, and, and I said, oh, you look like you've been having fun all week, Friday. And, uh, and he says, uh, oh, yeah, we've, you know, I said, are you building one of the big ones? And he goes, oh, yeah. And I said, uh, how do you like it up, up, up tall, or do you get to go up there? And he goes, well, you know, I, I don't mind it so bad. He goes, uh, but, you know, we do talk about all those ancient building techniques where it was all levitation and not so backbreaking. I'm not kidding. They speak amongst themselves about the ancient levitation. So that was my second comment. My third, well, the question is, um, now you talk about, you know, that, that his ideas about magnets and we're all a magnetic universe is sort of like his grand unification theory solution. And I'm just wondering, uh, we have dark matter today, which is, what, 97% of everything. Sure. And, and as far as I'm concerned, that would make dark matter sort of one mega uber omni magnet <laughs> i don't know how <laughs> big you want to go with this but i i was just curious would um uh would ed have known or or is it in his writings anything that would even come close to what we now call dark matter okay and before you answer that rl was the book gravity is a push because it was a fellow by the name of walter wright who wrote it back in 1979 Oh, well, that, yeah, gravity is push, yeah. Okay, oh, that, so it's 1979, not the late 60s. Right. Walter okay. Walter Wright wrote it. But uh, what do you think of dark matter, R.L.? We've got a minute left before the break. Well, I think that uh, Ed would highly agree with her statement that when I heard them say dark matter, uh, I said they're catching on to Ed uh, because it is the ocean in which we swim. It comprises everything magnetism is everything it's like we don't know we're wet fish don't know they're wet because they're constantly surrounded by water we don't realize we're magnetic because we're constantly swimming in it and i think that that is what dark matter is somehow some way this guy was able to pick up on this kind of information and carry it with him and I've got to tell you, that is the mo that is as perplexing as how he moved those stones. How did he get this information? That's what I want to know. I think that he got it the way I'm trying to get it now, by observing the people before me who did it. 
That could be. Well, stay with us. R.L. Pool with us. Those of you on hold, we'll get to you. We're taking phone calls here in our final segment on Coast to Coast AM. And don't forget to like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, and email me at george at george, george at coast to coast AM dot com. Okay, welcome back. R.L. Pool with us. We'll get to your calls as well in our final segment here. R.L., when is your book finished? I'd love to talk with you about it when it's done. Well, thank you. I'd love to come back and talk to you about it. I'm in the process of writing it uh, right now, and I'm in the market for a publisher. So um, as soon as I get it finished, uh, I'd love to uh, get in contact with you and be a guest on the show again, because I'm having just too much fun right now talking about the Coral Castle. When you were first down there, for the very first time, was it? Uh, did it give you shivers? It was a little overwhelming for me. Because um, you knew a lot about it before you went down there, right? I did. Um, I had done, well, I, I knew a lot of what people had said. I'll put it that way. The first time I went, um, I went kind of like, a child with just open eyes and just taking it all in and no preconceived notions. And when I did that, I was overwhelmed by the amount of work and the precision and the dedication and I think a little bit the loneliness that had to come Mm, from doing that work. Whenever I'm in a spot that is historical, I, I try to think about the actual events that occurred there, and I try to picture them. And I could only, and I've not been there at Coral Castle, but I could only imagine what it was like to picture someone like Ed Leith Skullnan walking around, moving these stones, and doing what he did. That was amazing, I bet. You know, I think that that is the answer to the question you asked me earlier when you said, what would I ask Ed? You know, I don't think I would ask him anything. I would just observe him. I would just watch him being himself. And that brings up another interesting question. Outside of those two kids that spotted him, how come nobody just went there and watched? I mean, the place was, it's out in the open, right? There were no walls hiding him or anything like that. Well, he put up walls when he got there. In fact, that was part of his job. Oh, he did? (laughs) Yeah, so the walls are actually made of the coral from Homestead. And the quarry is actually still open and right beside the Coral Castle, and you can see how he cut them out like pieces of cake. How tall are the walls? Uh, They are, I want to say, seven to eight feet tall, about four to five feet wide, and about as thick. Jeez. Every single one is a chunk, a large chunk (laughs) of coral. And he put them right in place. He did, and what something interesting he did with the walls was he left the wedge marks in the coral. Hmm. Uh, I don't know if that fascinates anyone else, but it fascinates me to no end, because he, in no other pieces on the Coral Castle are there any wedge marks. Why did he do that? I think he left them there as another clue, because when you look at the wedge marks, they, are, they aren't the kind of marks that you do from traditional uh, stone masonry. He used really thin, flat, wide wedges, the worst wedges in the world to use for breaking rock. And then there's slide marks in the coral, like it was like mud. There's displacement that is shown from all of these wedges going in, one after another after another, and they're all displacing the material. Was he sloppy? I'm sorry? Was he a sloppy construction guy? (laughs) (laughs) You tell me. I I think you know the answer to that question. Ed was very detail-oriented and quite the perfectionist. He left those there on purpose. There was no other reason because Ed wasn't that kind of guy, and you know that as well as I do. Right. Um, He left that there, again, another clue, I think, that stares us in the face and begs us to pay attention, that he is telling us, when I did this, this was soft. This was like clay. He put these in the coral like you put a, a toothpick into a pumpkin pie, like you knock down a yard sale sign in your front yard. This was easy. He was a 100-pound man. You're going to tell me he took a sledgehammer and was pounding steel wedges into solid bedrock? The hammer was bigger than him. <laughs> there's no way he could do it. I make two of Ed, and there's no way I could do it. 
I couldn't. I literally can't do it. And I haven't seen anybody else able to do that task either. Well, let's go to the phones. Jeff in Culver City. Hey, Jeffrey, go ahead. Hi, George and Mr. Poole. Yes, I'm so glad that you guys mentioned how connecting with certain frequency levels yeah. can possibly result in the movement of objects. An earlier Coast to Coast program with Mr. William Bill Burns briefly mentioned that particular attuned frequency levels will have certain individuals connecting with the dead. You know, he called it the spirit phone created by the great Nikola Tesla and Thomas Edison. Mm-hmm. But here in Los Angeles, California, we have the Watts Towers built by a man named Simon Rodea. And it's an upright vertical structure similar to the Leaning Tower of Pisa, Italy, where he was from, I was informed by Donna, your call screener, and the Eiffel Tower, you know, of, of Paris, France. But it's built just out of cement, uh, different refuse, glass, bottle caps, and other sort of metallic materials. But my question is, Mr. Poole, why are individuals like these gentlemen building these type of structures? Is it because they've been given guidance by God to, you know, to try in their minds, reach God by building these towering structures? And I'm asking it from a spiritual standpoint. And I think you answer up there. Well, have we, uh, have we lost you, RL? Yep, let's do it again. We'll try to get you back for the final round here of taking calls. But let's go to Annie in Alabama. Hey, Annie, welcome to the show. It's you and me, Annie. There's got to be some way someone can contact this man through dreams or through some kind of um, communication with the dead. I wonder if he's reincarnated. You know, I know a lot. I've been working on this same thing myself for years. I studied leverage. We've got the inclined plane, the pulley, the pry bar, the wheel, the ball bearings. Well, you never know. So, uh, RL, I don't know if you heard all of that, but she's wondering if somebody could try to reach Edward Leeds Skullman through some kind of a session, some kind of medium session or something, a seance, who knows? Well, I, the name of my channel on YouTube is Talking to Lee Skalman, and I've had people actually ask me this question before of, do I feel like that he speaks to me? And that isn't really what the name of the channel means. It simply means speaking on the subject of Lee Um But uh, I believe that you have to be sensitive to what you're studying. And I believe that the Coral Castle has been whispering, Ed has been whispering uh, for a long time, and it has gotten drowned out by folklore and tall tales and legends, but the truth is still being whispered behind that cacophony. And that you have to be sensitive enough to hear the whisper over the screams. True enough. Lewis in New uh, Mexico. Go ahead, Lewis. Take it away. Yes. Uh, the Torah, if you read the Torah, in small symbols above the literature are musical notes. Remember uh, King David played a, a lyre. I remember the walls of Jericho. They fell down. Mm-hmm. Also remember this. With trumpets, right? Yes. And if you remember this, all of Africa has no stone structures except for northern Egypt. The common denominator is Jerusalem. Ethiopia, the, where the Queen of Sheba was, is the only place besides Egypt that has, in that area, those big stone structures. The pyramids were built by Imhotep, who was Joseph. And they did this with these frequencies that can be found in the Torah. You might be right about that. There might be a little guide there for us, R.L. You know, we both have talked about sound resonance. Maybe maybe he's on to something. Well, you know, when he was uh, talking about that, I-, I couldn't help but think about a hammer. A hammer can be a tool to build, or it can be a tool to destroy. That's right. 
And that resonance, it can probably work against you as much as it can work for you. And so when you think about the trumpet sound uh, with the Ark of the Covenant as some kind of amplifier, um, possibly overwhelming the resonance structure of the wall and cause it to fall, it could be exactly the same way as uh, the pyramids of Egypt and the Coral Castle were built through some type of resonant frequency, but if you overdo it, then it becomes destructive. Catherine's with us, San Luis Obispo, California, west of the Rockies. Good morning, Catherine. Hi. Hi. Hey, I want to thank you guys for a really uh, in- engaging show. Oh, you're very welcome. Thank you. Uh, it's a I like great what, topic. Yeah. It's, 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 it you know, goes all over the place. For me, anyway. Like, I'm just thinking, you know, coral is a plant, right? If, you could, if you could only be a fish. <laughs> Okay. Anyway, I wanted. I liked what he said about you know the the fable about the story, clearing that up. That the guy you know wasn't pining after some woman, because I I knew he was going to say that, and I'm glad because I know a couple guys that are like these little geniuses, these little hundred pound guys that are friends of mine that people go to all the time to ask hard questions that are kind of like savants, you know. Yeah. And. Um, you know, they keep, you keep saying the guy was must have been lonely or whatever, but I don't think so. I think that, uh, you know, he just wanted to be left alone and do his work, and he knew that if he... He didn't need people around him. I think that if he, you know, he re, he wasn't a dummy, and he realized that if he said, hey, I know anti-gravity secrets, if he, you know, he would have been ruined his life. And then to, uh, I wanted to say something to R.L. R.L.'s listening. Yeah, Go ahead. Um, yes. You know, I don't. I don't. I, I hope you look into this and come back and tell us more secrets. <laughs> Find out more because and don't don't. Um, well, what's the word I'm looking for? Discredit or whatever that that spike a thing underneath the sign. You know, why would he leave it? Bam! Right there. You know. It, Maybe that's where they came from. There you go. See what I mean? It goes all over the place. Yep, it sure yeah. does. Yeah. And what about torsion? You know anything about that? Torsion. What do you think? Oh, that's physics for you. Uh, yep. in magnetic torsion field. That's right. Um, I think that that has a lot to do with the celestial alignments and the uh, magnetosphere of the Earth, because the Earth is a large toroid um, with a large uh, torsion magnetic field. When you have sphere magnets with their torsion fields and you have them all lined up in a row like the celestial alignments he shows on the constellation wall, uh, it starts to become pretty apparent that he was interested in torsion fields and the manipulation of them. Hmm. He was, was he a perplexing person? I think he was fascinating. Um, it was like he was good at everything. I read a story in Rusty McClure's book where he he fixed a. Uh, he had a wristwatch that he liked, and the spring broke inside the watch. And he knew and he how to work it. on that. Yeah. He fixed the watch with such accuracy. He said, I, uh, "A watchmaker looked at it and said, I wouldn't have done it this way.' He did it kind of a kind of a janky way. Yeah. But it's perfect. It actually it works and it's perfect. And he fixed it as well as you can with nothing. You know, he just he was able to just he was meticulous and thorough and detail-oriented and highly observant and very sensitive, I think. And I think that was the source of his um, isolation, was he was so sensitive that he had to be shut off from the world. Let's go to Clay in Miami, Florida. Hello, Clay. Good morning. George and R.L., how you all doing? Fine, thank you. Good morning. It, you know, I know you don't believe in coincidences, but the very first co-show I ever listened to was about the Coral Castle with Joe Bullard. Yep. Uh, and I, I've been hooked ever since. I, w- I was just down there with my wife Saturday at the Coral Castle. What did you think of it? Oh, uh, I've been going there off and on since the early 60s. I went there the, for the first time on a field trip in, I guess, about third or fourth grade. And this was back in, you know, the early 60s. And it I've been fascinated with ever, ever since then. 
And uh, there's just some really, really amazing things there. Like, um, RL, did you notice the, the big old door in the back that no longer works? Oh, the nine-ton gate. Yes. Yes. Oh, the nine-ton gate? Yeah, it's a nine-ton gate that, when it worked in its heyday, um, a, a toddler could push it open with one hand. Yeah, um, and that's that's exactly what happened. It it it's uh, it's on an axle. I think they said it was built from an old Model A, the axle. And back yes, then, when we were just little axle. kids. The guy giving the tour picked out one of the little girls in our class and said, "Poke that with your finger." And when she did, that door swung open. Ah. Unbelievable. Nine-ton gate, and it swung open. I, I mean, I, With a I, finger, I, I, a little girl's with, push of a finger. Yes. Wow. With a push of a finger. And, right, and I've been going there the, off and on for 50-something years, and I tell you, I'm just amazed every time I go there. It's, it's just always something new. How do you think, Clay, he did this? Well, you know, every time I go there, I, I, I mull that over, and it's just, you know, it makes me think of maybe... Uh, the magnetic thing, uh, yeah. uh, radio frequencies, and, and the uh, sound levitation. Who knows? But it's just, there's no way this little guy, and they have a cutout of him, a life size cutout of him. He's five foot, 100 pounds. He doesn't look like he can swing a hammer, let alone uh, lift any of these stones. How do we know he wasn't uh, an extraterrestrial and his buddies helped him, huh? <laughs> I'm open to anything, because when you go there and see with your own eyes, it, it it's amazing. <laughs> All right. Hey, thanks. We're almost out of time. We've got a minute left. All kinds of possibilities, R.L. You know, if this were a court hearing and you present the evidence, anything could happen, huh? This is true. This is true. And until we find the answer, um, this mystery, I think, is going to get a lot deeper before it gets solved. And I am uh, very honored and grateful to just be able to contribute anything to the field of knowledge in this area of research. Tell us about your YouTube channel one more time, how they can find it. Sure. If you go to uh, youtube.com slash user slash talking to Leeds Gallman, or you click on the link that's on Coast to Coast AM under my name, uh, you can watch my videos on these subjects and see my discoveries for yourself and subscribe to my page, and uh, be on the lookout for my upcoming book. The next time you go there, you've got to call in live on the program at night. Wouldn't that be cool? You have a deal. That would be exciting. And then you could walk around to kind of describe what you're looking at. Yes, let me give you my tour of the Coral Castle, as I understand Yeah, it. that would be great. R.L., oh, thanks. You keep in touch. Uh, let us know when the book is done, and we'll talk with you again. Fascinating subjects. I love it when things like that are happening on the planet. They're great mysteries. For Dan Galanti, Donna Walker, Tom Danheiser, Lisa Lyon, Lex Lonehood, Sean Lottasaur, Stephanie Smith, Chris Boros, and George Knapp, I'm George Norrie, somewhere out there on Coast to Coast AM. We'll see you on our next edition. Until then, be safe, everyone.